So our final presentation is uh, titled Measuring Workplace Stress Among Youth Our Actual RSIDA Participants. And it's presented by our Dwayne Fuchs and also John Outing. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just going to basically go through a little bit of an extended introduction to John uh, for his presentation that he's going to, uh, uh, to do on stress assess and uh, our RSI participants this year. Um, basically, just a little bit of a background with, you know, how this ties into ergonomics. Um, you know, most people here know that it's a, uh, the <clears throat> discipline concerned with the interactions between humans and the other elements of the system. Um, uh, just a little bit of an introduction um, in terms of the interactions of the body and the systems and ergonomics. We tend to, you know, view most of the ergonomic things that we deal with in terms of the physical aspects and the systems and the design. Um, but it also takes into account the, um, the brain and the mental aspects as well. Okay, next slide, John, please. So this is just a, an infographic of the example of ergonomic domains and applications. And again, just as I just mentioned, um, you know, we have the three main components of the physical, the cognitive, and the organizational. We tend to, with ergonomics, focus a lot, if not almost exclusively, um, obviously an error, but almost exclusively on uh, the physical aspect. But there's also the cognitive aspect and the organizational aspects that we really need to be looking at as well. And, and that's what, um, what the, the, the stress assess um, applications are about. Okay, go ahead, John. So when I bring that up, it it's still seems even now in, in the year 2024, still seems to be the elephant in the room. Um, we haven't addressed stress in the workplace um, as much as we potentially should. Uh, it is definitely getting better. Uh, you know, there's, we've, we've done more work with it. We've created these types of programs and these types of um, uh, surveys that we can measure this in, uh, but it still is something that we tend not to, and when I say we, I'm talking about our population in general, we're still not talking about it uh, enough or as much as we potentially should be. Next slide, John. Okay, and then when we're looking at the health and safety hazards, <clears throat> there's, there's a number of hazards that we tend to look at, as I mentioned before, but we look at safety, chemical, the physical hazards, biological, <clears throat> ergonomic hazards, hazards, but there's also the psychosocial hazards but again, we've kind of overlooked throughout time that we need to start trying to spend much more time on as well. Next slide, John. Okay, and then we have several, uh, we have some standards um, <clears throat> that, that are out there. The, the 45001, um, basically it says that, you know, hazard identification you should consider different types of the hazards in the workplace. And again, at the bottom of the list, unfortunately, is a psychosocial hazard, you know, such as bullying, intimidation, uh, threats of violence, those types of things. Are, it is a hazard that we need to start looking at a little bit more. And as I said, we're starting to, to move forward with that a little bit better. Okay, go ahead, John. So, I mean, this is just another, uh, this is an example of, you know, psychological health and safety at work where we do have guidelines and we do have uh, standards involved in terms of these types of things. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> and in this, in the, in the ISO 45003, it basically goes through 25, uh, 21 psychosocial factors that potentially happen at work. I'm not gonna go through them all, but you can take a look at the difference 
or, or the many different things that are potentially involved in that. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> we do here, you know, in Canada have the CSA standard that does provide some recommendation um, about about psychological health and safety in the workplace. Um, and it's there, it's there and it's been created so that we, we have something to look towards, but we, we don't necessarily have any legal, any legal implications regarding these types of things. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> in that, uh, <clears throat> in the, the CSA standard, basically it lists 13 psychosocial, um, risk factors plus the one, the other, that basically other things that, that, that people identified in terms of workers. And they're, they're listed out there in terms of, you know, things like engagement, work management, all of those types of things. And it lays it out in terms of a lot of the different aspects that sometimes we may not, you know, think about in terms of our, our psychosocial risk factors at work. Go ahead, John. So there is legislation. Um, and we do have some legislation out there in terms of things that that address this. But the bottom line is the last statement on the slide where it says it's voluntary. It's a voluntary psych, uh, psychological health and safety standard. And we need to be looking at that in terms of maybe we should be pushing it a little bit further. Go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is basically just uh, an article in terms of how uh, chronic stress is, is recognized or not recognized um, in, in terms of WSIB claims in, in, um, in Ontario. Uh, this article was written about a year ago, basically stating that uh, WSIB rejects more than 90% 90, 90 of the claims. Go ahead, John. And their reasoning was um, claim, uh, they can't make claims for stress caused by employment related decisions, including changes in productivity requirements, scheduling, disciplinary things. Um, it, their argument is workers also cannot make stress claims for interpersonal conflict. That pretty much takes into account most of what happens at a workplace in terms of productivity, those types of things. So just uh, wanted to bring that forward. Okay, go ahead, John. And, and a good point is that, you know, in the EU, there are legal requirements for psychosocial risk assessments. Um, they do have a different system than what we have. And that's a, a good portion as to why uh, we, we tend to try to look, look towards them to be the front runners for what we hopefully should, uh, should be striving towards. Go ahead, John. And now we get to the most important part of what I need to be saying here is that now <clears throat> Our very own stress us out guru, uh, John Odike, is going to continue on and explain explain to you what he what he's done uh, with the results of uh, this year's survey, uh, as well as the survey that he <clears throat> he implemented, I I believe, back in 2018. Um, I, I'm not going to read all of the accolades because we could have another 60 or 70 slides worth of accolades for him. Um, but let's suffice it to say that he's the stress assessed guru and I'm going to turn it over to John and thank you so much for advancing my slides. John. Well, thank you, Dwayne, for the introduction and setup. So, uh, since we're on the theme of money, uh, I thought I would, uh, touch on it at the beginning. Martin Shane, uh, has estimated way back in 2008 that. Uh, 10 to 25 percent of the population mental health burden, which is 51 billion dollars in uh, in uh, Canada, is occupational 
and so they noted annually that three to eleven billion dollars of these costs to society and the workplace could be prevented by changes in the workplace. Um, so, like MSDs, uh, there's a lot of money uh, to be saved if you address this problem. However, the problem is that most employers don't see it. Uh, maybe in their sickness and accident costs, but uh, they assume it's just a part of the background, a part of uh, the cost of doing business. So stress assess is what we've been using to uh, do psychosocial uh, risk assessments or in the workplace. And we, we use a five-step approach. Uh, we came about this uh, the hard way. We, we first, when we first developed the survey, we threw it out into workplaces and we realized that we had to prepare people. Uh, they need to learn about it. They need to get their ducks in a, in a row, organize uh, the workplace so that uh, they're receptive to it and they're ready for it. Um, then you do the assessment, make the changes, evaluate whether those changes are effective. And when you do the evaluation, you learn some more and you go around this continual improvement circle. So uh, the first step is learning, and uh, it's important for uh, a workplace to familiarize themselves with some of the basics, deepen their understanding, and the committee that's involved in this should share their awareness and identify resources. Uh, one of the things to learn is uh, different levels of prevention and different uh, scope. Uh, we talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention at or for health and safety at the source, along the path, and at the worker. And for the individual, uh, primary prevention in the psychosocial field is uh, developing coping and appraisal skills. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about re resiliency. At the secondary level, uh, that's when people are experiencing some symptoms, but you're trying to get them to manage them before they become uh, at a level where they interfere with work, so wellness, relaxation techniques such as mindfulness. Um, tertiary prevention is helping those who have been um, succumbed to some kind of uh, um, mental illness or disorder, and they need therapy, counseling, medication, and support. Now, there are different levels we can look at it. We can also look at it the organizational level. So tertiary prevention at the organizational level is getting recognition for chronic uh, stress in the workplace, like uh, Dwayne talked about. There's also employee assistance programs, return to work programs. Uh, then there's secondary prevention, which is more or less raising awareness. Uh, mental health first aid is an example. Uh, but Primary prevention at the source is the uh, thing that people are talking the least about, and that's what we're trying to focus on with stress assess, is uh, addressing the culture, the climate uh, of the organization, the work structure, and the way the work is organized. And as uh, Dwayne mentioned, we have a standard in Ontario or in Canada, uh, the CSA Z. 1003. However, it's interesting to note that when this standard was put together, uh, the people who were on the committee actually made uh, a conscious decision to replace the word psychosocial with the word psychological. And that uh, really points to a perspective issue which needs to be uh, uh, looked at. From the psychological perspective, uh, if you're dealing with stress in the workplace, you're focusing on what's going on between my ears. It's an individual issue, and uh, it's been labeled as responsibilization. Uh, if there's a problem, it's in my head, and uh, I'm responsible to fix it. The psychosocial approach is more about the interaction of uh, my head with your head in the environment that we uh, share in common. And so it's both an individual and a collective responsibility. 
So the second step is organized. Uh, first of all, you can't do it alone. You need to recognize uh, how ready your workplace is to do with this type of thing. And if it's not as ready as we think it should be, then we need to raise awareness and get a commitment. One of the big important things to do is uh, don't try to do it alone. Uh, in fact, if, if you uh, try to solve other people's stress problems, you'll probably be, make them worse. So um, we don't need the, the knight in shining armor to uh, solve the problem for other people. It's a thing that needs everyone's involvement. So how do we do this when we go into a workplace to do a psychosocial risk assessment? Well, first of all, we need to establish a steering committee and get buy-in from the workers and management. Uh, we recruit a coordinator or a, a champion in each unit uh, who's knowledgeable and motivated. Uh, then you administer the survey. Uh, we have methods to try to get good response rate. We always aim at a 80% response rate, but that's pretty hard to get these days. And then you have to realize that once the survey is done, it's just the beginning of the program process. Uh, now the dialogue begins to improve the issues that have been identified. So then we get to the assessment. So how would you go about uh, doing a psychosocial risk assessment in the first place? Well, um, there are ways of measuring stress hormones in your body and uh, elaborate ways of uh, allostatic measurements. Uh, however, when we looked at these, uh, we found that in reality, when a person has a, a psychosocial or a, a stress problem, uh, they don't go to the doctor and get a blood test for uh, any stress hormones in their, in their body. Um, the physician asks them questions, and these are based on the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. And uh, here's an example of some of the questions uh, that are asked uh, for screening for depression. If you have five of these in the last, uh, five of these positive in the last uh, a few months and they interfere with your, your ability to uh, function uh, daily, um, then you're eligible for uh, treatment for depression. So doing a survey is a way of asking a question, but instead of the individual, we're asking the group. But it does give the individuals in that group a voice. Uh, it has anonymity, so it often redirects issues from being based based on uh, personality conflicts to a more objective and inclusive basis. Uh, just answering the survey will actually raise people's awareness. Uh, this is one of the feedback uh, things that we've, we've uh, had from many people. It also provides a vocabulary for dealing with some of these issues, uh, which can help them come into uh, ideas for solutions. And if the issues are addressed, working conditions obviously could improve, but it is a big if. And what we see a lot is uh, workplaces who are curious enough to do a survey, but not committed enough to respond to it. And if you're in that case, uh, we often advise people not to do a survey, because if you're going to ask people to share their psychosocial concerns and emotions about them in a survey, and then you ignore the results, um, i.e. you don't take action uh, to address the issues that arise, you've probably made things worse. So the survey that we're based on is the Copenhagen Psychosocial Questionnaire, or COPSUC, and we use uh, the version three uh, it's available online if you go, uh, if you click on this uh, uh, link, uh, you'll get a guidelines and how to use the questionnaire. And uh, here's a paper that uh, provides evidence for the 
validity and the reliability of it. And uh, we were involved with a number of other countries, uh, seven different countries, and we uh, jointly uh, produced this uh, evidence for the validity and reliability together. So what's in the survey? Um, it looks like about uh, a third of you have already filled it out, so you probably know what's in it, but for the others, uh, we asked about work demands, quantitative demands, work pace, and, but also uh, emotional demands. Issues around work organization, how much influence you have, the possibilities for development, how meaningful your work is, and how committed you are to your workplace, which is uh, another way of measuring engagement. Then we have workplace relationships. Predictability is about uh, being well informed, communication, being recognized, uh, being appreciated and treated fairly, role clarity, leadership. Uh, supervisor uh, support and support from colleagues and uh, role conflicts. Then we have what's called uh, social capital uh, or the, the workplace values. Uh, is there a trust between management and the workers? Uh, are there conflicts resolved fairly and work distributed fairly? Uh, these are justice and respect issues. Then there's the basic things employment factors, whether you have insecure or unstable work, um, whether you're satisfied with your job and work-life conflict. And then there's uh, the presence of offensive behaviors like sexual harassment, threats of violence, physical violence, and bullying. We had a group uh, that got together back in 2009 and uh, came together and called themselves the Mental Injury Tool Group, and they're the ones who developed this survey. And it's been about 15 years now that we've been working on this. And when we did it, we did uh, pilot studies. And when we did pilot studies, uh, people said, uh, there's something missing from your survey. On work demands, the, the missing things were um, unpaid hours uh, when you're when you can't finish your work in the allotted time and you have to stay extra time, which is not paid, working through your breaks. Uh, the percentage of time that's uh, devoted to paperwork instead of doing the work that you really want to do. There's measures of employment precarity and other job factors, the number of hours you work, uh, whether you have overtime, uh, things like that. Uh, we also added some workplace culture and climate uh, issues. We had a, a PhD student uh, who's doing her thesis on some of these factors, and so uh, we incorporated those into the survey. Also, health and safety concerns, which includes ergonomics and other uh, physical factors. Uh, if these are present in the workplace as a concern, uh, that also contributes to stress. We also look for some health effects, and uh, the longer cups up version has questions about self-rated health, stress, burnout, sleeping problems, somatic and cognitive symptoms. And we also added the offensive uh, behaviors of discrimination and vicarious. Vicarious is when uh, you're not the victim, but you see it happening and that affects you as well. And then there's the uh, demographics uh, so we can compare different categories and departments and things like that. Now, we also have a reference uh, set of data, and that's collected by uh, a polling company called ECOS. And uh, we've had three surveys now, 2016, 2019, and uh, 2023, just a year ago. And uh, it's uh, over uh, 4,000 uh, working Canadians in workplaces where there are at least uh, five or more employees. Uh, the survey is available in French and English. And uh, weighting factors are applied so it can be considered representative of the Canadian working population. We've also had help from uh, the Institute of Work and Health, uh, Peter Smith, uh, particularly, and some of the people that work with him. Uh, and we were able to establish various types of validity and reliability. And uh, this paper was published and is available free. Uh, 
So you can download it if you need uh, evidence for the validity and reliability of this survey. We've also published a few other papers over the last uh, couple of years. And uh, right now, uh, there's another one in the works on uh, job theft or sorry, wage theft. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, uh, what are your results? Um, well, first of all, uh, the response rate, uh, I assume that uh, there were a, a thousand people who would register for this. Uh, I'm not sure if Trevor knows how many people are on right now, but it'd be interesting to hear. Trevor, do you know? We have 365 right now, John. Okay, well, if we have 305 completed uh, surveys out of 365, uh, I assume those who filled out the survey would be more interested in attending, then uh, we probably have a lot higher uh, response rate than 30.5%. Uh, the survey also allows people not to uh, uh, fill it out uh, or to decline. and. Uh, some people said they were uh, not comfortable with the terms and conditions. About 177 uh, declined to uh, to participate. So an 80% response rate uh, statistically. If 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 you have 80% of your group, uh, the other 20% will probably not significantly change the results, and so you can be pretty confident that you have a representative sample. Uh, as the numbers get lower, uh, it gets less and less uh, representative. And when you're uh, at the bottom here, um, if we were at 30%, uh, we would not have a representative sample of the uh, population. However, uh, we do have uh, a number of people, over 300, who have expressed their concerns uh, about what's what. Uh, how they experience the psychosocial conditions in the workplace. And if we see issues that can, can be improved for that 30%, uh, the other 70% that didn't fill out the survey will probably not be harmed by that. It just probably wouldn't be in the uh, order that it might have been if everyone had participated. So um, this is an issue of the squeaky wheel getting greased. So, how do we compare your results? Well, we have the uh, Canadian average that we talked about earlier. We also do an internal comparison with a correlation matrix where we uh, compare the to see if there's a correlation between the exposure factors uh, and the outcome, uh, the symptom factors. And then we also do a comparison uh, between departments, groups, or variables such as uh, gender identity, age, or job classification, that type of thing. And we'll start off now with uh, comparing it to the Canadian average. So here are the, uh, the Copsuck scales. Um, there's three uh, scales for demands at work. So um, the RSA they, participants who responded uh, have worse uh, quantitative demands and emotional demands than the average uh, Canadian uh, respondent to our, our general survey. But your work case is uh, a little bit better. Uh, it's on the better side. Uh, the middle is the Canadian average. And if you're on the right side, you're better. And on the left side, you're worse. However, gray uh, means that you're not really statistically significantly different. Uh, if you're one of the other colors, uh, then you're probably at least a meaningful di uh, difference. Uh, interestingly, participants, RSID participants, uh, have more uh, better influence and better meaning of work, uh, but they do have uh, worse uh, life, work life imbalance. All the other issues are relatively. Uh, different than the average Canadian. Now, we also took these and compared them to the survey that was done in 2018. So this is the uh, 2018 RSI averages. And uh, 
The ones on the right hand side have improved over time and on the left hand side have worsened. So you can see there's uh, an overall uh, leaning towards the right. So things overall have improved. Uh, role conflicts though have uh, gotten worse. But other than that, uh, influence has increased and work pace has uh, slowed down. And here are the general health symptoms. You can see they're all gray, so they're all not really different uh, than the Canadian average. Uh, burnout is, is less and cognitive symptoms less and sleep troubles more, but not uh, significantly, not a meaningful difference than the average. And when we look at uh, differences between uh, RSI Day 2018, we see that sleep troubles uh, have gotten better, but everything else has gotten a little bit worse. Uh, but again, uh, they're gray, and so statistically, the, the difference is not very meaningful. Um, it's interesting because if it was the same people who filled out the 2018 survey as today, you would expect with six more years of age, uh, you would have had more sleep troubles because sleep troubles uh, increase as you age. Uh, take it from me, I'm 65. Um, and then we have the offensive behaviors and uh, all of them uh, are less than the Canadian average. Uh, except for vicarious offensive behaviors, uh, just, just slightly more. And then we have a table where we look at the impact of these offensive behaviors. And uh, for the first column in the blue numbers here, you, you see the symptom scores, um, scores of all the uh, symptom questions in the questionnaire added up together from zero to 100. And so uh, you see, for instance, for bullying, those who did not experience bullying in the last year have an average uh, symptom score of 40. But those who've had uh, bullying experience in the last year from their colleagues or from the manager or superior uh, have 56, 57 as their uh, total symptom score, which is um, 15 points higher more than 15 points higher than uh, if you hadn't experienced them. So you can see what an impact they have. Uh, bullying from subordinates and from clients and customers is not as uh, impactful as uh, from colleagues and superiors. Now, when we compare it to the 2018 RSI date, um, we see that three of them have increased uh, physical violence and discrimination just slightly, but sexual harassment uh, actually quite a bit, whereas threats of violence and bullying and vicarious offensive behaviors has declined over the six years. So if we look at physical violence, it's probably the most objective uh, of, of the questions because uh, what's considered sexual harassment or a threat of violence uh, is more open to interpretation, whereas whether or not you experience physical violence is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so physical violence is uh, kind of the anchor that we use, and uh, the difference is, is slightly higher. Uh, but uh, has the perception of what is considered threats uh, of violence and bullying changed? And uh, we've seen a, a steady decline over the years that we've done the Cross Canada survey from 2016 in the uh, percentage of people who feel they've been bullied. So the question is, um, are things in the workplace becoming uh, more civil? Or is the perception of what is bullying uh, declining? Uh, what used to be considered bullying in 2016 may not longer be considered bullying in uh, 2024. Uh, and that's where I like to uh, allude to the uh, Trump effect. If we have our leaders and our in the media, uh, a lot of uh, offensive behaviors becoming the norm. Uh, 
is our sensitivity to these uh, issues uh, actually going down. But for the sexual harassment uh, in this group, it it, uh, it went up, and I'm wondering here whether the uh, the Me Too movement has changed the perception of uh, what is considered sexual harassment, and we're becoming less tolerant. Some things to think about. Then we have additional questions, which were not in the COPSEC, some of the ones that we added after the pilot. Uh, and here, um, most of these are uh, no different than the average. However, um, adequate staffing levels had a worse score than the Canadian average, but accommodations for outside responsibilities had a better one. So I'm going to put this little logo up at the top here, which is just a reproduction of this uh, figure. And uh, I'll go into some of these uh, specifically. So here we're going to look at psychological health and safety climate. And in 2018, we had 53% of the group uh, on the positive end of the scale and 22% uh, on the negative end. Uh, the question asks, how would you rate the psychological health and safety climate in your workplace? And the options are uh, healthy, supportive, uh, good, fair, neutral, not so good, poor, and toxic. And in 2024, um, it, the number on the positive side fell a little bit, uh, probably not a meaningful difference. And on the negative side, went up uh, a fair bit, uh, four points. Uh, percentage points uh, out of 25 percent, which is just uh, probably uh, bordering on significant there. And just for comparison purposes, the Canadian average is 75 percent on the positive and 18 percent on the negative. So things are uh, a little worse for RSA day, uh, participants, both in 2018 and 2014. So now we're going to look at culture, whether or not the organizational culture tolerates uh, harmful behavior. And we have almost 40% on the uh, positive end of the scale and 32% on the negative. And uh, that has changed. Uh, it's become more positive, 48% on the positive. And uh, the negative has stayed roughly the same, 30, almost 30%. And these are... Uh, very close to the Canadian average uh, in 2024. Here are the health and safety concerns. And here uh, people could rate them as uh, concerning, annoyed, uh, or actually interfering with the job. Uh, there were also uh, lesser uh, items on the scale. Uh, interestingly, for RSI day, ergonomics was top issue, uh, followed by thermal comfort and physical factors, which is uh, noise and lighting. But biological hazards were also uh, close by, which is understandable given uh, just went through a pandemic, and we're still not in it. And here's a comparison of uh, how uh, RSI day participants uh, rated uh, different hazards compared to the Canadian average. And, Rate ratios here, and uh, your your sensitivity to ergonomic hazards is greater, or maybe your exposure is greater, uh, or maybe both. Uh, your uh, rate for working alone, safety hazards, and dangerous chemicals is uh, a fair bit less than the Canadian average, and the rest are pretty well typical. So then we look at the internal comparison. Or correlation matrix. So on the left hand side, we have all the exposures, the quantitative demands, work pace, etc. Um, down here and across the top, we have symptoms. We have five symptoms, and then we have all symptoms. All symptoms is a sum of all the five uh, other symptoms. And these are in red as negative uh, factors. And then we have positive factors, engagement, job satisfaction, psychological health and safety climate as positive factors, and work-life imbalance as a negative factor. And so what this is, is the Spearman correlation uh, between each of these pairs of variables. 
So for instance, if we look at meaning of work and uh, engagement, uh, correlation, Spearman correlation coefficient is positive, which means as meaning of work uh, goes up, uh, engagement goes up, and it's quite strong, uh, 0.59. Uh, perfect correlation is one, and or negative one, a negative correlation, and uh, no correlation is zero. So you see that meaning of work here does not have a big impact on burnout, stress, uh, sleep troubles, and um, cognitive and somatic symptoms and all symptoms, or on work-life imbalance, but it has a big impact on job satisfaction and a, a somewhat uh, impact on psychological health and safety climate. And so this is kind of a heat map. If you squint your eyes and look for the dark points, that's where the strongest correlation are and the white areas are where the weakest are. And we'll focus on two of these, uh, all symptoms as a, positive, as a negative uh, outcome and engagement as a positive outcome and we'll uh, get rid of these others so we can see it more clearly and then we'll order these in order of the strength of association. So for the symptoms, uh, the strongest uh, association is uh, between role conflicts and symptoms but followed by a lack, there's a negative here, a lack of justice and respect. Uh, Job insecurity uh, increases symptoms. Vertical trust, the more vertical trust you have, the less um, symptoms you have. And so if we look at these top four here uh, as being the strongest ones, uh, we can see that justice and respect and vertical trust are both um, part of uh, the social capital. Then if we look on the positive outcome, uh, predictability, which is being informed and uh, communication, meaning of work are the top two. And then we have another bunch that are very close in, in, in uh, strength, recognition, uh, quality of leadership, role clarity, uh, vertical trust, and justice and respect. You'll notice that uh, meaning of work is near the top of engagement, but it's near the bottom of symptoms, as we noted earlier in the, in the matrix. But we also notice that justice and respect and vertical trust, which are social capital, are both uh, in engagement and symptoms. So for meaning of work, if you increase meaning of work, you increase engagement, but you don't really affect the symptoms. Whereas if you, uh, increase uh, justice and respect and vertical trust, you improve engagement, but you also uh, decrease the number of symptoms. And so it has both a positive and a negative uh, effect, whereas other factors like meaning of work only have uh, an effect on either positive or negative. So what is the cost of these issues? Well, social cost, capital is really the combination of trust between workers and management and justice and respect. Um, so what is the cost of increasing trust and what is the cost of improving justice and respect? And then what are the benefits of in, improving both, uh, not just the cost, but uh, the positive side? And so uh, I took this uh, from a quick uh, screen capture from Rick Gogan's presentation this morning. And uh, I thought I would use his, his diagram here about the cost of improvement and the value of benefits and the payback. So what happens if we, uh, we drop down, really there's no cost to improving uh, justice and, and, and uh, respect or uh, trust. And the benefits are, are obviously uh, payback would be right back to uh, zero. I just thought I'd throw that in. Uh, then we have a comparison between internal departments and groups and variables. And what we do is uh, we color code them. Uh, if you're for the cops up questions and scales, um, we have, uh, if you're red, you're worse than the Canadian average, but if you're green, you're better. 
And if you're yellow, you're the same as the Canadian average. We're using the 2019 here. Uh, for offensive behavior, uh, none is the only positive color, uh, white, and then uh, just shades of uh, red from there. And again, uh, we start to think of a difference in scores when we see a score of uh, difference of um, about three, and the range is from zero to 100. And if it's above uh, seven, then it's a mean, definitely a meaningful difference. But uh, somewhere in between three and seven is where we see uh, beginnings of a real difference. So here are RSI day 2024 column and 2018. So quantitative demands have not really changed. Uh, the difference, uh, I went an extra decimal here, so you can see the difference. Uh, work pays has dropped from 60 to 56, which is a drop of 4.2. Influence has increased 4.4 from 51 to 56. Meaning of work has increased. Role conflicts have also increased, uh, which is a negative uh, thing. Uh, so we also have uh, um, self-rated health has dropped uh, four points. Uh, we've seen this uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. Uh, when we looked at before and after the pandemic uh, surveys, uh, generally people's perception of their own health ha has decreased uh, to some degree. Burnout uh, has increased a little bit, but not as much as in some of the surveys we've seen. Um, stress has increased. Uh, cognitive symptoms have increased. Uh, sleep troubles, as I mentioned, uh, dropped, which is uh, counterintuitive because you've aged, but it's probably not the same people. Uh, bullying has dropped, and we talked about that, uh, whether this is the Trump effect, or where bullying is becoming more acceptable. And uh, vicarious offensive behaviors uh, have dropped. Then we look at who answered the survey. Well, we had 75% uh, uh, identifying as the female gender and 24% uh, of the male gender, uh, almost 1% for other. We also uh, break it down by uh, whether or not you're considered management, and 43 and 57% split there. So with gender identity, uh, this is as I'm comparing females to males, and for females, they have higher quantitative demands, higher work pace, and higher uh, emotional demands. They have better uh, possibilities for development and communication whether they feel they're getting the information they need to do the work is worse for a female. Social support from supervisor is a bit better, but these numbers are quite small. Uh, they're not as large as when we consider uh, differences, whether you're management or not. Um, the work pace for managers is uh, uh, five points higher. However, um, these higher uh, demands at work are counterbalanced by having better um, influence, more possibilities for development, more meaningful work, and more commitment to the workplace, uh, being better informed, uh, being uh, recognized, um, better role clarity, less role conflicts, uh, Interestingly, they can they uh, they rate their quality of leadership higher than those who are not management. So you can see quite a difference. Uh, the uh, work organization, job content, interpersonal relationships, and leadership scores. Whether or not you're part of management, and again, this continues. Uh, female uh, gender identity. Uh, respondents had less job insecurity than the males. However, they had more of all the uh, uh, symptoms, uh, a significant amount more. 
and also um, much more sexual harassment is two and a half times higher than for the male. Uh, bullying was uh, four percentage points higher. Discrimination was less, uh, which is interesting. And when we look at management, uh, job insecurity is less for managers. Um, job satisfaction is higher. Uh, vertical trust, uh, justice and respect are higher. Um, many of the health uh, factors are either the same or better for managers. Um, they experience less physical violence, less bullying, less discrimination, but they see more uh, vicarious offensive behaviors, which is uh, interesting. So we also looked at uh, a number of economic sectors and healthcare, professional, scientific, and technical service, manufacturing, public administration, and education services uh, made up 73% of uh, the respondents. Uh, so we'll look at those very quickly. You see emotional demand stands out like a sore thumb for healthcare. Um, when we look at quantitative demands, manufacturing is slightly higher than the others, but these numbers are, are fairly close. Um, emotional demands is quite low for uh, the professional and technical. Uh, if you look down the column here, professional and technical are doing quite well uh, compared to the others. Uh, Whereas public administration looks like it's having a bit of a, a tougher time, especially with role clarity, lack of role clarity. And we, when we look at uh, some of the other factors, we see the same patterns continuing and even getting stronger for the uh, public administration. And then we had uh, the comments. And uh, the program itself has a, a, a word cloud that it produces, but uh, I generally find word clouds uh, not very informative, uh, but this is it for your, for your comments. However, uh, with the help of um, Daryl Stevens, and uh, we ran the comments through the uh, chat GPT and asked it to summarize them. And uh, these are the issues uh, there are eight issues that we found. Workload and work-life balance. Uh, many respondents uh, concerned about workload, feeling overworked and struggling to maintain healthy work-life balance. There are also uh, long hours, difficulty managing personal and professional responsibilities. Uh, support and accommodation. Um, employees value employer supports, accommodation for health issues and mental and adherence to workplace safety regulations. Unionized employees cite the collective agreements and legal protections as valuable resources. Uh, Managing and employee relations. Uh, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with communication, perceived favoritism and conflicts over how rules are enforced. And uh, also tensions between management expectation and employee needs, uh, particularly when enforcing policy and managing workload. Health concerns and accommodations, uh, stress related conditions, chronic health issues, personal factors uh, are affecting uh, overall well being and productivity, and accommodations for these issues and ergonomic concerns uh, and mental health supports. Uh, were essential for maintaining employee health and performance. Culture and organizational challenges, um, the impacts of stress levels, on job satisfaction, uh, some respondents experiencing toxicity, bullying, and inadequate support for well-being initiatives. Uh, things like restructuring and cultural transformation uh, are causing uh, uh, impacts on working conditions and morale, personal and professional development. Uh, they have uh, desires for uh, improving their careers and uh, despite some of the challenges, uh, some of the uh, respondents uh, mentioned that they, they, they still uh, feel satisfaction in the work and uh, feel um, quite supportive uh, 
from uh, colleagues and supervisors. They also mentioned some self-care strategies. Environmental and operational factors, um, physical work environments, operational in inefficiencies contribute to stress and lack of performance. There's issues related to transparency and information sharing and teamwork and impact and productivity. And just some feedback on the survey. Some uh, respondents felt the uh, survey design and the questions uh, had bias or leading prompts. And there were also clarifications about the appropriateness of the survey for uh, different situations by, uh, where a person is working on their own and some suggestions for improvements. And the bias um, is something that comes up quite regularly. And I think uh, I'd like to just spend a little bit of time to deal with this. Are these uh, questions biased? Uh, some of the biased questions that have been pointed out is whether or not you feel there are adequate staffing levels. And uh, you can see here that 47% uh, disagree and 35% agree. Uh, that there are adequate staffing levels. The other one is how many hours per week uh, you work without pay. Uh, and here the average is uh, 3.6 hours and how many minutes of your pay break time do you work? Uh, and uh, currently I'm collaborating with uh, some people at the Institute of Work and Health uh, on a paper on unpaid extra hours of work. And one perspective uh, on this is characterized that this is donated work, a symbol of uh, how dedicated you are to the workplace, that you're willing to work overtime to get the job done, even if you're not being paid. Uh, another perspective on this sees this as uh, wage theft. So when we're talking about bias, um, yes, there, there's probably no uh, unbiased position on this. And uh, so when we actually broke it down, we broke it down by whether you're management and you have uh, extra hours, zero extra hours, or non-management with zero extra hours, management one to five extra hours per week uh, unpaid, or non-management and six or more. And uh, these were set up by the uh, Raz Shahidi, who's the uh, main author of this uh, coming paper. And you can see here that uh, there's some truth to this, that uh, having more than six hours and being management, your scores are much more positive than if you're not management. And uh, here it gets even starker, uh, the difference, even in the offensive behaviors and symptoms. So working six hours uh, a week without pay is uh, quite uh, harmful for those who are not management, but doesn't seem to affect those people who are management. Now, you could argue that uh, people who are management get paid more and therefore they're compensated for those extra hours, uh, um, whereas uh, those who aren't in management uh, do not have that benefit. So when it comes to bias, it really uh, is, are you going to look at the individual and uh, try to focus your, your psychosocial program on, on uh, supporting the individual, or are you going to look at workplace causes? And if all you're doing is looking at the individual, then the type of uh, solutions to your problems are things like stigma reduction, self-care, healthy lifestyle, coping skills, et cetera, et cetera. These are all positive things and can help individuals, but it's, uh, are you really getting to the cause and, and stopping that rather than applying a band-aid to the solution? So again, uh, there is a, a bias in many programs that they focus on the individual programs where if you wanna talk about a bias for stress assess, yes, uh, it's for changing the organizational, uh, the primary prevention at the source. So once you uh, find, do your survey and you, uh, how do you find 
the solutions to your your concerns. Well, um, the International Labor Organization has a booklet called Stress Prevention Guidebook, which has uh, um, a lot of ideas on how to do this. Uh, for instance, uh, workload quantitative demands uh, is checkpoint six. And I really like this number two here, reduce unnecessary tasks such as control operations, writing reports and filling in forms or registration work. Um, from another one, uh, hospital guidance tool that we found, emotional demands. Uh, again, this last one here, the possibility of withdrawing a place for privacy, being able to chill out if you've had some kind of emotional or traumatic experience uh, and just collect yourself before you go on the floor and face the next crisis. So our suggested way of doing this is you present the results and collect initial reactions. Uh, you can do this in a town hall or you can uh, write a summary. Uh, set up focus groups to brainstorm solutions uh, and also anonymous uh, in case people are uh, too shy to uh, contribute to a focus group. And then the committee takes all these ideas and works them up into some recommendations, which are uh, presented to uh, management. And there are resources along the way. Uh, we are not psychologists or facilitators, but we have a lot of experience and we can uh, connect you to some information. And once the recommendations are implemented, you wait for a period of time, usually one to two years at least, uh, and assess it again. There are some uh, tools online, uh, that are available templates that allow you uh, to, to use, to uh, plan, uh, to summarize the results, to uh, document the recommendations and uh, summarize uh, the results. So um, then after a while, let's do it all over again. Give it some time. Uh, I recommend two years uh, in Europe where it's mandatory, uh, two years is the uh, required time between surveys. We put together a lot of information on the five-step process in uh, what we call the mini net. It's uh, a guide on preventing mental health, mental harm uh, in the workplace. And it has two case studies and we work these two case studies through the uh, five steps so you can see not only what the steps are, but how they're implemented in real workplaces. And if you would like to uh, see some videos of workplaces that have used this survey, and some of them a number of times, uh, these links here go to various uh, videos that we have on our website. So thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for filling out the survey. Uh, you know, it takes about uh, 20 minutes and I appreciate all the time that you put into it. And I'd be glad to take any comments or answer any questions. Great, thanks, John. It's actually really interesting seeing the uh, comparison there between 2018 and today. There are a few questions for you. First one is cognitive impairments are on the rise brain fog after COVID, et cetera. Any way for earlier intervention before accidents? Well, um, that's one of our outcomes, cognitive symptoms. And uh, so a survey, a psychosocial assessment uh, will allow you to identify the workplace factors that are contributing to it. Obviously the pandemic and aging and other things uh, contribute to uh, brain fog and cognitive symptom. But uh, you may see a correlation uh, uh, with, uh, let's say, work pace uh, can also contribute to, to brain fog. With psychosocial issues, um, the, the causation arrows go both ways. And so, uh, it's important to realize that uh, people may have brain fog and then be exposed to workplace stress, but that workplace stress may cause a feedback loop to the uh, to the brain fog and aggravate it. Uh, and 
and vice versa. And you can have no brain fog, but you're so busy uh, and and stretched in so many different directions that you you experience confusion and a lack of focus, which can be interpreted as brain fog. So. Uh, a lot of these things are not straightforward. It's not like, uh, you know, you get exposed to a virus and you get a disease. It's back and forth. And uh, so it's a little more complex than the traditional medical causation or even uh, ergonomic uh, exposure outcome uh, uh, pathway. Uh, John, has Oakham noticed any particular sectors? They may be more receptive to supporting stress and psychosocial risk factors. Oh yes, uh, we do a sector breakdown, and so we we actually have uh, sector specific uh, profiles. For us. Um, generally, uh, right now uh, I'm working with uh, uh, government agency, uh, looking at. Uh, in the uh, health and safety field, uh, doing a, a stress survey there, but I'm also doing one uh, for uh, airline attendants. Uh, so we get uh, different groups coming to us all the time. Um, I'm not sure. It's usually uh, issues within uh, the workplace that, that prompt uh, the need uh, to take stock of the psychosocial conditions. And, and so um, it, it's different for different sectors. And, uh, you know, the uh, the office work sector is, is probably the predominant one, but we are involved in other sectors as well. Okay. Is there any data correlated the results of psychosocial surveys to physical MSD symptoms? Yes, uh, there's quite a body of uh, research that shows that uh, actually uh, going in Okawa ourselves, when we used to do uh, office ergonomic evaluations uh, 25 years ago, we included the uh, demand control uh, questions uh, from Karasek uh, in with the uh, the, uh, the ergonomic exposure uh, and symptom uh, surveys. And uh, yes, um, it, it's been demonstrated very clearly that if you're under stress, uh, the risk of uh, MSDs uh, are much much higher. Uh, than if you're in a, a workplace where the uh, psychosocial conditions are more supportive. Okay. Is there any WCB data showing increased ap approved claims year over year where psychosocial factors were determined as a leading cause? Uh, I think Dwayne uh, highlighted the uh, Toronto Star article on it. Uh, the criteria that the WSID set for um, for uh, uh, accepting a chronic stress uh, claim is much higher than for any other uh, any other um, occupational disease. For instance, if you if you breathe in silicosis over many years. Uh, uh, it has to be a significant contributing factor. Uh, for uh, chronic stress, it, it has to be more than that. It's not just a significant contributing factor. It has to be the predominant cause. Um, some of the other reasons uh, for denying claims, which are probably even more prevalent, are defining uh, what's normal in a workplace, uh, for instance, one of the claims that was appealed is for a uh, education assistant uh, who was dealing with behavior uh, issues, and uh, the employer and the WSIB first agreed uh, that, sorry, this is just part of your uh, your job. 
but later on at uh, the appeals tribunal, uh, it was ruled that despite that it's a regular occurrence, it's still a traumatic occurrence and uh, warrants uh, compensation. And so um, the clauses that state normal uh, uh, workplace uh, uh, employment conditions not, not being exempted and also uh, personality conflicts not, not what is bullying except the personality of conflict between personalities. So, yeah, I think uh, they're treating it with a, a much higher bar. And so uh, the, uh, the trend for uh, acceptance is very low. Um, I think it's uh, more than 90% are denied. Okay. Well, perfect. Thank you, uh, John and Dwayne, for a great session.